I mean, if we, I mean, on to rehabilitation, I take the, the condition that we look at rehabilitation and put something else in. And, you know, we saw in various lines there, if you took out on COVID and you see Parkinson's disease, for instance, the vast majority of people with Parkinson's have never been admitted to hospital for their Parkinson's with managing that vision. No one would ever turn around and say, oh, you have no problems. You've never been admitted to hospital. Absolutely. So thank you for those insights. They're really, really proud. I want to pick up on one specific issue which we've, we've touched on, um, particularly in the video uh, first thing today, is about the vocational aspects of rehabilitation, which is something which uh, we've worked on for a long time in meetings on long-term conditions. and something which I, I, I believe we've got the direct expertise in. First of all, I'd just like to acknowledge all of our colleagues here in Locomotion and all of the other funders and people involved. Uh, in the work that we do. So thank you very much for working with us and, and for your support. So vocational rehabilitation, maybe for those who are working in, in other areas, is a process whereby we can support and work with somebody who's living with a long-term condition or a disabling condition, so that they're able to access, maintain, or return to their employment or some other form of occupation that they find needful. Now, as many of us are aware from both our clinical work and our own personal experiences, many long-term conditions might mean that you were unable to work, and that can be an unfortunate consequence of the impact of the condition. But where I think we have a particular role that we can play is in the concept of work instability. And this is a mismatch between what you are able to do as a person and the demands of the work that you're hoping to do. <coughs> And in some cases, that might mean returning to work in the face of the condition you're living with, or it might mean remaining in work and trying to balance the demands of the work and the demands of your long term condition. Some of the uh, processes that we put in place uh, to support someone through a vocational rehabilitation program um, are individualized and graded because we are dealing with a very individual. Uh, type condition here. And this is traditionally known as work conditioning. And it's about reducing the limitations that you experience as a person in terms of doing the, the roles that you have in the workplace. And these are the foundations for being ready to return to work or supporting you maybe in increasing your hours or the duties that you have in the workplace. And part of that is acquiring or developing the skills that you need to be able to match the gap between the work and the workplace that you have. And in parallel with that, we also need to put in place changes or modifications to the workplace. Now we're all familiar with better screens or different types of mice or keyboards or different chairs. But a lot of what people are telling us about COVID is in relation to uh, timing, hours, rest periods, breaks, and other uh, practical supports like that are particularly important. Now, the greater uh, impact of long COVID work, I think has been mentioned already this morning, but just some figures in here uh, from a study which was done about 18 months ago. We're finding that the impact is greatest of long COVID in people of working age. Now, that might be because it was people who were putting themselves in danger of catching COVID in the early days, particularly the healthcare workers, social care workers, teachers, and so on. Um, and we know that nearly half of all people who are experiencing long COVID have to reduce their work, and about a quarter were not working at all. So this is a huge impact on our community and on our society, particularly when we think of the overall numbers of people with long COVID in our country. And that impact is proportionately greater in communities who find it difficult to access health services. Now, when we started out in locomotion, there was no evidence whatsoever for vocational rehabilitation interventions in long COVID. And we were bringing together interventions that we had for other conditions, particularly around management of fatigue and musculoskeletal conditions. And I'm hoping that the work I'm just going to show you now will help inform that evidence base. So we had two aims in Workstream 1.4, which is around vocational rehabilitation. The first was to understand the needs of people with long COVID. And the second was to develop the program. Now we're just about to embark on the second aim, 
And so I'll just talk about the results from the first day of what we've achieved um, over the last few months. So we interviewed 20 people all together, all of whom have been attending long COVID clinics in the same way that many of you have uh, worked with other individuals. We also interviewed seven therapists who were working in the clinics and seven what we term key informants. So these might be line managers, uh, human resources, occupational health personnel and so on who are, who are working with people returning to or remaining in work even with long COVID. We did a thematic analysis of these interviews and we've been working with uh, the patient advisory group to work through those. Now, so far we've only worked through the interviews with the uh, people with long COVID, so I'll focus on those uh, those results today and hopefully at a future stage I'll be able to talk about some of the other uh, insights as well, but it's looking like we're all triangulating around the same uh, themes, which is uh, very reassuring. So there are four main themes which have come out of the work that we've done. The first is the return to work process, which many people have gone through. And there are a number of sub themes in that. So the timing, <coughs> so when, when do you attempt to return to work uh, following a, an acute diagnosis of COVID? And at what point during the long COVID journey do you do that? And it's not a, a linear process. And this is what one of our um, interviewees said. It's a trial and error process. And there needs to be a lot of time given to people to work with on COVID to work out the perfect solution. And that mirrors what a lot of other people experience with other long term conditions. So that, that's not surprising. And there are a number of factors which worked in people's favour in returning to work. Some of these would predate the, the onset of, the, of COVID, so people who had a, a good uh, low sickness record, people with good relationships with their manager with a longer length of service. But then when COVID did happen, people who were working in jobs that had an occupation sick pay policy or workplaces which introduced a COVID sickness policy that was bespoke to, to COVID itself, those were beneficial in enabling people to remain in and uh, work with. But then people told us about the challenges that they experienced returning to work and it's no surprise here that people found the demands of the work role were probably the greatest. But a lot of people didn't really appreciate the impact of returning. So being acutely unwell and then being in the recovery phase and being at home and gradually kind of getting your life back together, but then making that step into the workplace was too much for a lot of people. But at the same time, the employer's approach was very important as well. And what was critical here was people who might have safety critical roles. So these might be somebody who works in a railway signal box. It might be a nurse who's administering medications on board. And what, again, one of our interviewees said, I'm not as aware as I thought it was, and that's dangerous because I'm not aware of my limitations. So this is what we would traditionally term rehabilitation and a lack of insight. You need to know where your strengths and weaknesses are so as not to put yourself into a situation which might be dangerous for you or for other people. And then people were concerned about what the next 12 months would hold. And of course, for many people, they're coming up to the end of occupational sick pay, uh, moving on to statutory sick pay. Employers are saying, well, we've given you this length of time off. What are we going to do now? So those fears were very real for many people. People were worried about navigating future challenges. A lot of people, and we heard some of the things uh, on the video at, at the opening that were not so helpful that people said, and the, the focus on me um, was it might be well meaning, um, being kind to myself isn't going to pay the bills, it isn't going to get me food, and it isn't going to keep a roof over my head. And that's someone who is self employed said that, someone who doesn't have the benefits of occupation sick pay or uh, having really access to occupational health in their workplaces. And this is where the uh, worries about job retention came in, where I think we might be able to make a difference. And then finally we asked people for their reflections. And these were broken down into three main areas, what helped, what didn't help, and what might have helped. And I think focusing on what might have helped could actually be really powerful to enable us to develop an intervention. So one, 
the person said what helped them was they allowed me to say what um, I felt I could do. So that's really helpful if you feel that the, the locus of control is passed to you and then you can decide what work, work roles you feel safe and able to do and build on that. And then what didn't help, as you just heard, the um, post-exertional uh, aspect of long COVID, it was clear that actually pushing through wasn't going to work. And this is being reiterated time and time again. And then what would have helped, and a lot of people said this, is advice to managers on how to properly support staff. So if we could put information out there that tells employers, this is what to expect, this is how to support someone living with long COVID back into work. Oh. So phase two of our rehabilitation, I'm hoping some of you um, later this morning will be able to help me uh, develop this, which is developing that vocational rehabilitation. We really have a huge amount of information from the people we've spoken to and just bringing that together into a program that we can then uh, test across our long COVID clinics and in other uh, situations and then finding out from people how they found that and that can bring us to the next stage where we take this into. I'd just like to thank you. I'd like to thank, um, in particular, Amy Parker, who's on the call here, for, for doing a huge amount of work behind this, and uh, all of our colleagues in the group. Thank you very much.